Well, at least let's get the setup out of the way of the novel, because I don't want to give too much away. But let's get the setup. What happens off the top? The novel begins with a, a horrendous traffic accident. Um, a little girl is walking to uh, to the shopping center with her mother when she's hit by a, a speeding truck and grievously injured. Essentially, it turns out brain dead and beyond repair. And her parents, over the, the course of several days, are faced with a difficult choice as to whether they they should take her off life support. And they decide to do so, but she doesn't die. And I'll, not only does she not, not die, she seems to recover from her injuries, except she remains comatose. And uh, in this sleeping state, miracles start to happen around her a few months after they bring her home from the hospital. Like actual healing miracle. Actual healing miracle. And it was important to me that they be scientifically verifiable and quantifiable and free of questioning. Like these are these are miracles. They're there. You have to accept them. The characters have to accept that they're happening and they have to deal with the, the ramifications of that knowledge. The other character in the book is the hit and run driver. Henry. He really feels awful. He really does. He, ta he takes it quite personally. And um, I think because he has children of his own, he realizes what he's done to this little girl. And the thought of, of having to face his children and explain what he's done just compounds his guilt. And eventually he does, he does, he drifts around for a couple of days and, and then decides to end it all. He can't, can't face it. He feels haunted by this little girl and he decides to end it. He tries to kill himself, he tries to throw him off the, the cliffs of Dallas Road, which if you know Victoria is, you know, fairly high and overlooking the, the strait. And, um, he, he, he leaps off in the middle of the night at the, at the same moment that, uh, that Simon and Karen are pulling the plug on Sherry and he's saved. Uh, he's he's pulled back by, by forces unknown and what he doesn't realize immediately is that in being saved he's also been damned because he literally disappears no one can see him uh, no one can hear him and uh, until he, he ends up in the Victoria Public Library because he's checking the newspapers to keep track of the progress of his family and he gets locked in overnight one night and he discovers that there's a, a tribe of men just like him um, seemingly immortal and invisible to everyone else. They can see each other, but nobody else can see them. And they've been in the library waiting for him. Then there's Father Pete. Father Peter. Father Peter, who, um, one of the creepier characters I've read this year. Well, that's nice to know. <laughs> <laughs> a nasty piece of work. He was a nasty piece of work, and he's, um, he arrives on the scene. He actually watches the accident as it happens and uh, doesn't help and then wanders to the hospital and is present in the corridor when uh, when Sherry's taken off life support and this miracle happens. And, and he's personally offended by the fact that she's A, alive, and then B, that she can help other people. He's personally offended, but he also he also knew it was coming. Father Peter... Uh, is very similar to the characters in the library and uh, in fact they know each other and uh, he takes every step he can to prevent these miracles from ever being made public um, and to prevent when that doesn't work to stop the family from letting the public in and is increasingly desperate and is increasingly violent and draws a crowd of followers, this rapturous cult of true believers who, who think they're doing the right thing in, in helping this man of the cloth um, essentially destroy this family for the greater good. One of the things that's happened over the last 10 or 15 years is the religious right, particularly in the US, has co-opted the notion of good and the notion of right and it's got to the point now where if you're not devout if you're not saved 
you cannot be good in these people's eyes. And it's, it's spreading. It's spreading throughout the culture. And um, even people who don't buy the whole package are adopting that perspective in a very scary way. And in that compounded with a sort of moral relativism is, is quite a scary thing. And I, I, I fundamentally believe that it is possible to be good without God. I believe in a in an underlying morality and in the in the inherent good of people. And when when Simon and Karen make that decision that they know is going to to change their lives, when they decide to let the pilgrims into their house to be with their daughter because it might help them. I think that's a powerful it's a powerful and empowering decision on their part. Nice job with this one. I really enjoyed it. Oh, well, thank you. That's nice to hear. The book is Before I Wake. It's a novel. I've been talking to the author, Robert J. Wiersma, and Before I Wake, published by Random House of Canada.